Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome um, to the briefing, Strengthening the Educator Pipeline, Evidence-Based Approaches to Teacher and Leader Preparation. Thank you all for taking the time on this uh, rainy Tuesday to join us today. A special thank you to Senator Kane's office uh, for all their help in putting this event together, particularly his wonderful staff, Karishma. In the last few years, Congress has passed a number of bipartisan bills affecting education, the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and most recently, the Career and Technical Education Act reauthorization, both bipartisan efforts. And our hope is that in the new Congress, they will continue these efforts and move forward with the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, where there are a number of real opportunities to support state and local efforts to prepare a diverse and highly skilled educator workforce. And we know that as states begin the, the heavy lift of implementing ESSA, that having a strong teacher and leader workforce will be critical to those efforts. So we're really excited to share the research and uh, advice from practitioners on what policy has been working in their states and districts. Uh, we also want to make sure that everyone here has received the materials. There's folders outside. If you didn't grab them on your way in, please grab them on your way out. We are really honored to have Senator Tim Kaine, who represents the great state of Virginia here today. He serves as a member of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee and is co-chair of the Senate CTE Caucus. As a former civil rights attorney, Senator Kaine has been a, long, a lifelong champion of issues that advance equity and opportunities from criminal justice reform to women's rights to workers' rights. Senator Kaine brings that same commitment to uh, education-related issues and uh, was pivotal in the reauthorization of the Career and Technical Education Act, which included a number of evidence-based policies to support career and technical education educators. So we're really honored to have him here. Senator Kane recently introduced the Preparing and Retaining Education Professionals Act, which supports evidence-based approaches that ensure that all students, particularly those the furthest from opportunity, have access to well-prepared and a diverse set of teachers and leaders. It's my pleasure to introduce Senator Kane. Hey, thank you guys. What a, uh, we're gonna have to get a bigger room next time. This is so fantastic to walk in and see how many people are interested in this topic of evidence-based creative strategies to attract and retain great teachers. And I wish some of you had joined me for the last two hours. Linda, we were having a superb hearing in the HELP Committee about ESSA implementation, where we had three uh, chief state school officers, um, and we also had a national uh, education thought leaders kind of talking about what's working so far uh, and what still isn't working and uh, is, is out there for Congress to push on to achieve both achievement but also continue to focus on accountability and reducing inequities and, and performance gaps. So it's very, very good to, to be here with you. Uh, this is a wonderful organization that's really at the forefront of uh, helping our students be all they can be. Um, I have been thrilled to work together with you on the PREP Act, which we introduced recently, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute, but I just also want to acknowledge I have three, my, my education A team here, many of you know Karishma Merchant, and then, let's see, Karishma, and then Courtney, where is Courtney, and then Sasha right here, who's a fellow with me this year. We have a superb education team, but Jessica omitted the most relevant part of my bio, which is my wife is the former Secretary of Education of Virginia and now serves on the State Board of Education overseeing all of K-12 schooling in Virginia, about 1.2 million kids. And I can tell you when they have their monthly meetings, and it's usually Wednesday afternoon, evening, and Thursday once a month, the largest topic during the time that she has been on the board has been teacher shortages. Um, teacher shortages occupies a portion of virtually every meeting that they have. And in that, I bet it's like West Virginia. You're probably grappling with the same issue because we're seeing this all over the country. Um, just, just some statistics that I probably don't have to share with you. Um, this group knows these pretty well, but it does put it into some context. Um, more than half of American states in 2015-16 academic year reported shortages of educators in math, science, CTE, and also shortages of, of educators for English language learners, more than half the states. 48 states identified special ed as a shortage area, and half of all schools and 90%, 90% of high poverty schools are struggling to find qualified special ed teachers. If the current trends continue, 
it's going to get worse. We'll see as few as 200,000 available teachers each year by 2025, resulting in a gap, an annual gap of more than 100,000 uh, that we are not able to fill every year. Um, the gap also ties into another significant area that we need to be concerned about, and that's teacher diversity. In public schools today, the, the majority of student populations is comprised of students of color. However, our teachers of color comprise 20% of the teacher workforce. African American teachers made up a little bit more than, made up more than 8% of teachers in 1987, but 6.7% of teachers in 2013. And so our teaching workforce needs to grow, needs to grow in these specialized areas where there are gaps, but also needs to grow in terms of being more reflective of the students who are in our public school classrooms. And so we have to look at creative strategies. Localities are doing some cool things. We've got a Virginia example here you're going to hear about. States are doing some cool things, but we also have to look at creative strategies at the federal level to deal with shortages and diversity and specialty areas where we continually come up short. I am glad you've got a great panel, including a chief state school officer, which is like always really good to hear from that sort of frontline position. But I am ex especially glad to have uh, Dean Andrew Dare, who is the dean at the VCU School of Education. VCU is, the, is my hometown university. I live in Richmond, 30 plus thousand students um, and wonderful work on training educators, especially educators in urban settings. And then he's got a, a prized pupil with him, Brittany Jones. Brittany is a graduate of VCU, but I know she's going, and now teaches at John Marshall High School, which is the conference of high school in the neighborhood where I live. But you're going to hear from Brittany about a particular program, a teacher residency program that takes uh, students and really prepares them for teaching in, in urban areas. And you'll hear her talk about that uh, because I think that is a model that we can use going forward. Um, as Jessica mentioned, the, the next big item we're going to tackle on the HELP Committee is the rewrite of the Higher Education Act. And this is incredibly important because we just, we just don't rewrite these laws that much. And it really puts a lot on your shoulders to try to do them right. You know, normally when we reauthorize, we might not reauthorize again for five to ten years. So that means when we're reauthorizing, re reauthorizing higher ed, we better not just think about tomorrow. We have to think down the road about some of these issues, all kinds of issues. Uh, last year, the House passed a version of a higher ed reauthorization, the Prosper Act, that omitted Title II, which deals with teacher training. And, and, you know, and they have a lot of complaints about us, too, I shall say. But, but what, what I want to point out is we, we cannot, we cannot uh, do a higher ed act that doesn't address in a creative and forward-looking way teacher shortages and how we need to bring people into the classroom. Um, the committee, as you know, on the Senate side tends to have a pretty good track record, though there's wide ideological differences on the committee. we got a pretty good track record of hammering through and doing reauthorization. We're very proud of the Perkins Act reauthorization bill that President Trump recently signed. I had a number of provisions in that bill that I was particularly proud of as the chair of the CTE caucus in the Senate. But I have the same, because I've seen us do it, I have the same confidence that we will get there on Higher Ed Act reauthorization, but we'll only get there and really do it well if, if you all are deeply, deeply engaged in the discussion. I started off the day in Richmond with a statewide gathering sponsored by the Virginia Chamber of Commerce of nearly a thousand including all of our K-12 and higher ed professionals around the state to talk about workforce needs. And I challenge them, just like I'm challenging you, when we're rewriting the Higher Ed Act, it's a really good time to be involved in giving us your ideas. Um, obviously, from the education community, in terms of how to train teachers and attract teachers and retain them, you're going to have fantastic ideas. The workforce folks in the Chamber of Commerce business leaders I was with this morning, their ideas are going to be really good for us in figuring out where workforce gaps are going to be outside of the teaching profession. What are the needs that we're going to have and the jobs that we need to fill? And so how do we have a higher ed, ed system that matches up with what the economic needs will be for the next 10 years? But you're going to give us the best advice about the, the uh, attraction and retaining professional development. Uh, building meaningful and satisfactory lifelong careers for teachers. You're going to give us great advice about that. Just to say a word about the PREP Act, and we're, again, excited to have it in. Um, I believe it's bipartisan, isn't it, Krishma? 
Um, it's almost bipartisan. <laughs> hey, in D.C., almost bipartisan. It's just like, wow. Um, but we're, yeah, we're very excited to have that bill in, and we work real closely. Linda and the team offered a lot of good thoughts to us about it. Um, so it has a couple of components. First, it's very much, the goal of it is, is to deal with the gaps, especially in particular areas where we're short, but also try to expand the diversity of the profession. It expands the definition of high need districts under the Every Student Succeeds Act to include those experiencing teacher shortages, which could be rural communities, and also, so in geographic areas that are experiencing shortages, but also in subject matter areas where we have shortages, as I described before. It encourages school districts to have innovative partnerships with local community colleges and universities to ensure that we're building the pipeline we need. We call them grow your own programs. Um, you know, we looked at the fact that so many of our schools have very talented teachers, aides, um, who are really talented, but maybe they don't have the degree or, or they haven't had the time to maybe be in the class full time. Um, when you have a talented educator, and you can just tell by looking at them, now this is a talented educator, why don't we help them achieve the educational uh, degrees and certifications they need so that they can be full-time classroom teachers? Um, this is a, a bill that requires states to do some work in sharing data to identify shortages, um, both regionally um, and in specialty areas, and that it dramatically increases uh, support for teacher preparation programs at min minority serving institutions and HBCUs to try to deal with the diversity issue. One of the provisions that we just had passed as part of Perkins also dealt with teacher training, which is to recognize that often the CTE teachers are coming in in a different way. They're, they're often coming from industry, so things that we've done in Perkins are also trying to deal with this teacher training issue by bringing in people through career, career switcher programs and things like that to help us have the CTE educators we need as the nation seeing a renaissance in career and technical education. So I'm very, very excited to be asked by LPI to come and just say a word about it. And to, I, I guess we were the one that signed up for the room today. You need a senator to do that. Um, but, to, but to see everybody here, to see some great Virginians who are gonna share innovations. And I'm taking this crowd as a complete commitment to work with our office when we get into HEA reauthorization next year so that Title II provision can be uh, very, very robust and can be not just good the day that we pass it, but that it continue, can continue to be forward focused for the many years that the HEA reauthorization will be in effect. So I'll hand it over to the panel. Uh, have a great discussion this afternoon and I look forward to continuing to work with you as I go forward. Linda, hand it to you. Well, it's wonderful to have the senator uh, do a lot of my work for me. <laughs> he really understood all the research and presented a good piece of it. Uh, I want to uh, start, however, by thanking uh, Jessica Cardishan, where did she go, uh, for uh, all of the work uh, that we've been engaged in around this um, development of the bill, but also the uh, holding of this briefing. Uh, and all of our LPI staff, there's a whole slew of them here in the corner under the able organizational hands of Shawnee's hood. I don't know where Shawnee is, she's probably out at the table. <laughs> so it uh, takes a village to throw one of these uh, parties, and uh, I really thank the village for doing that. Um, we have been working on taking the uh, evidence base uh, about teacher training, recruitment, retention, and preparation, and trying to think about how it could inform legislation going forward. Our recommendations that are drawn from that research are in the folder that I think uh, is out on the tables there. And I'm just gonna take a few minutes to review uh, some of what the uh, issues are in building a strong teaching profession. Uh, you know, uh, the Higher Ed Act has a lot uh, in it other than teaching. But teaching is the profession on which all other professions depend. And so we think it's a central part of the goals of an act that is trying to create uh, the um, sort of knowledge base for our country in a variety of ways. So for us right now in this country, uh, key issues that are before us are, as uh, the senator already said, solving shortages. Uh, many of you saw about the teacher strikes that were going on. Uh, West Virginia was one of the 
places, and Steve can tell us how that has worked out and what they're working on there. Uh, teachers' uh, compensation has declined since the early 1990s and is at one of its lowest points, about 30% below that of other college-educated workers, and many states are working on that agenda. Uh, working conditions uh, during the recession, uh, class sizes grew larger, uh, conditions in schools grew, grew poorer, almost 30 states uh, are uh, still not spending as much as they were in 2007, so that has created uh, challenges um, in uh, schools as part of the attractiveness or lack of attractiveness of the profession. Uh, the status of the profession, there are, um, there's a new Phi Delta Kappen poll, I don't know how many of you saw the Gallup poll, where uh, people in this country respect teachers and trust them, but don't want their own children to be one. Uh, and this is the first year in the years of the Gallup poll that the majority of the public said, you know, I think teachers are great, but I wouldn't want that life for my own child. And so the status of the profession is part of the issue as well. Entry pathways matter a lot. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. When people come in uh, to teaching uh, without the support and the uh, knowledge base that they need, they tend to leave very quickly. And then we get a level of churn, and it's very hard then to catch up um, to uh, having a stable teaching force. We also have to worry about improving the quality of preparation to meet the demands of the 21st century, which we are educationally just entering so many years later because we were slowed down by focusing uh, on um, a kind of learning that was not uh, as uh, em emphasizing higher order thinking skills as we need to be thinking about in this uh, knowledge-based economy and the rapid rate of technology change. Um, just as one example, technology knowledge is doubling every 11 months. So we have to really prepare young people for um, working with knowledge that hasn't been discovered yet, with technologies that haven't been invented yet to solve problems we haven't solved yet, and that's a different kind of teaching. And of course, we have a very diverse student body, and teaching for diversity successfully is part of the challenge. Uh, around the world, uh, there are high achieving nations that have really built the capacity to have a high quality, stable, well-prepared teaching force without shortages. Uh, we did a study recently called Empowered Educators of five countries that have such uh, both high achievement for students and strong support for their teachers. And uh, the recipe is common across them. They have competitive salaries that are equitable across schools and districts. Uh, they have strong universal preparation in many countries that has, it comes at no cost whatsoever um, to teachers and uh, they may earn a salary or a stipend while they're in training. Uh, extensive training in partner schools. In Finland they call them model schools where uh, teachers are trained, the schools are connected to the university. Uh, quality mentoring is available for all teachers and often there are career ladders so senior teachers or mentor teachers um, uh, progress up that career ladder and then are available in every school uh, with training to support beginning teachers. Uh, most uh, of these countries have 15 to 20 hours a week for collaborative planning. In the U.S. we have about three to five hours a week for teachers to have individual planning time. Uh, and we have our teachers teaching the greatest number of hours in the week and in the year of any country in the world. Uh, so that's another part of the sustainability uh, in the profession. Uh, you'll find uh, sustained practice-based collegial learning opportunities where teachers have time together and are using it for action research and for planning. Uh, the careers reward and develop and share expertise so that everyone is getting better as teachers move up the career ladder and share what they know. And they also organize sharing across classrooms and schools. These are many of the features that will be on the agenda as we bring up the work that needs to happen here. And you'll find these practices uh, and conditions in some states, but not very many. And you'll find a few of them here or there, but rarely do you find them all in one place. As we think about addressing teacher shortages, you've probably seen uh, different kinds of uh, headlines in newspapers in your own state that look like these. Uh, and we've seen these for the last several years. Uh, and uh, the shortages, uh, in fact, when we uh, first at LPI looked at the shortage trends, the supply going down and the demand going up starting in about 2015, 
We predicted that by 2017, we might have a, a gap as big as 100,000 teachers. And actually, our researchers this year looked at the state data from each state to see how many vacancies were either unfilled or filled with teachers who were not prepared. And it was a little bit over 100,000. So in fact, that prediction has come true. And we have at least 100,000 teachers or uh, classrooms around the country that are filled, either unfilled, uh, filled only by a substitute or by a teacher who has not uh, yet completed or even in some cases started their training. There's been a decline in teacher preparation enrollments. Uh, these data go only through 2014, but if I continued the trend, you would see that it has dec decreased even further since that time. As the senator said, there are um, very severe shortages in special education in 48 states plus DC, in mathematics, in science in more than 40 states. Uh, more than 30 states have shortages of teachers for English learners. Uh, and also shortages of teachers who are in career technical education. And this has been the, the circumstance for several years now. There are a lot of equity concerns that follow from this. Uh, this is from the civil rights data set, and in high minority schools, you'll find about four times as many uh, teachers who are not prepared as in low minority schools. Uh, and that's pretty uh, typical across the states. If you're interested in the state-by-state -state accounting, the Learning Policy Institute has an interactive map on our website, and you can go to a state and see what their uh, situation is with respect to the attractiveness of teaching and the equity concerns with teaching in that state. So one of the things that we typically have done in the United States, rather than increasing the incentives to teach, uh, which is what would happen in Singapore, they would just raise the salaries and say, uh, teacher shortage magically solved, we typically lower the standards. We typically are quickest to lower the standards in the communities where kids are lower income, uh, where there are concentrations of students of color. And one of the problems with that strategy uh, is that teachers who have very little preparation leave teaching at two to three times the rate of teachers who have comprehensive preparation. So then you get the revolving door where you're having to hire uh, more teachers the next year, uh, in addition to dealing with the effects of uh, lower student outcomes. Preparation and early mentoring uh, both uh, in influence retention as well as effectiveness. If you have a well-mentored teacher, they are twice as likely to stay as if they don't receive mentoring. So there are some straightforward ways to begin to reduce that turnover. And that's very important because 90% of the jobs for which we hire teachers each year are being uh, vacated because of someone who left the year before. So attrition accounts for 9 out of 10 uh, vacancies each year. Uh, if we could just bring our attrition rate down to about what it is in places like Canada or Singapore or Finland, uh, we would not have a teacher shortage, simply by keeping the teachers that we have uh, and in increasing their capacity to do the job. Uh, funding for both uh, preparation and mentoring has declined. The debt load for preparation has increased. How many recent college graduates do we have in here? Uh, <laughs> you know about that debt load? Uh, and only about two-thirds of teachers therefore receive comprehensive preparation before entering. We have actually fewer teachers getting mentoring now than was true some years ago before the recession. We had gotten up to about 75% of teachers with mentoring. Now we're down closer to about half because those programs got cut during the recession. The costs of college are high and debt loads are high at graduation, uh, over um, close to 20000 for white graduates, over 20,000 for black graduates. And you can see that the differentials, the blue bar is white graduates, the red bar is uh, black graduates, that the difference in debt load increases the further uh, people get out from college uh, for everyone, but particularly for uh, African American graduates. And that actually feeds into the lack of diversity in the teaching force, because we know that people who can't afford to pay off the debt load on the salaries they're going to earn are less likely to go into careers um, that uh, will leave them with that differential, even if they want to be a teacher. Uh, it's, a big, um, it's a big problem. And one of the uh, side effects is that teachers will come into teaching uh, legitimately trying to make a living through an alternative certification route where they are learning to teach while they're teaching. Uh, and that is true for one of four teachers of color because of the debt load. 
Uh, but then that's associated with much higher turnover. So we're recruiting people, but we're not retaining them. And if we really care about teachers, and if we care about teachers of color, we would say, uh, we, if you will teach, we will pay for your education. Uh, and that then becomes the incentive that will allow us to fill positions with people who will be able to stay, uh, both because they can afford it and because they're well prepared. Uh, we know that students benefit from a racially diverse teacher workforce. Um, one of the points the senator made, uh, teachers of color are disproportionately likely to go teach in high minority schools. Uh, three quarters of teachers of color are teaching in the top quartile of schools that uh, serve students of color. Um, they offer benefits to all students. Uh, the research shows that all students feel uh, that they benefit from teachers of color and have good experiences uh, with those teachers. Uh, they contribute to a culturally responsive learning environment and they produce uh, higher academic performance, greater graduation rates, uh, attendance rates, for, uh, particularly for black students and for other students of color. Partly because of just the affirming uh, presence and supports that are delivered, which can be delivered by white teachers equally well if they have the training to do that, but this effect is one of the many reasons that uh, we need to be thinking about a diverse teacher workforce. Um, so one of the key things that uh, the Higher Ed Act can do is to increase access to high retention pathways into teaching. And that can include service scholarships and forgivable loans that really pay people's full way through college. I came into teaching that way myself and you pay it back with service. Um, we used to have very extensive uh, service scholarships and loan forgiveness for teachers. It's much smaller than it used to be. Uh, the TEACH grants are one aspect of this, but they need some revision and tweaking to be uh, available in a way that um, uh, teachers get to hold on to that uh, scholarship and it's not taken away. Uh, there's a whole storyline about that that we may get into. Teacher residencies and grow your own programs, as the senator noted, are very important. And we're gonna hear more about that. I just will say that teacher residencies are a really important solution to age old problems. There's the problem that it's very hard to teach in uh, high need communities where the skill set that you need is much greater than you would need in a community where kids are getting tutored and they have books in the home and all kinds of other support systems. And yet we often have the least well-prepared teachers in those communities. Uh, then we have the revolving door that I talked about. But in residencies where teachers get to train under the wing of the very best urban teachers, in schools that model the very best and most effective practices with their education and their uh, apprenticeship paid for, which they then uh, return in service, uh, you get both a more diverse teaching force, a more effective teaching force, and a more long-lasting teaching force in the communities that need it the most. Um, and then ongoing mentorship and support. So these are all parts of what the uh, act will need to deal with. In addition, we have new expectations for learning. Uh, everybody has you know, heard about and thought about the uh, skills that we talk about, the 21st century skills of problem solving and analysis and uh, really being ready for a global workplace, um, et cetera. And so we need t teachers who know things that were not so important in the past. Expert teachers who know content pedagogy, they know how to work with diverse learners effectively, they engage in culturally responsive practices, they understand and support social and emotional uh, development as well as academic development. They know how to work with families and communities in productive ways. And we know that places that prepare these kinds of teachers integrate theory and practice. The faculty actually model these kinds of strategies. They use uh, inquiry methods. They have deep clinical placements where you get to learn from expert mentors and they emphasize equity. And they engage in school university partnerships that really provide what a teaching hospital would provide in medicine, a place where you can see best practices and learn them. So these are all part of the agenda for uh, a higher education act that really prepares us and prepares a strong teaching profession for us. And we're gonna take a few moments now uh, with our expert panelists here uh, and learn about what both states and universities and schools are doing 
to uh, provide exemplars as well as to help us understand the challenges. So I'm going to come over here where I can see everyone. Um, and I'm going to start at my close left to introduce Dr. Steve Payne. Uh, Steve is the West Virginia Superintendent of Schools. Uh, under his leadership, the state has been singled out for its school leadership development programs and teacher quality efforts. Actually, Dr. Payne is coming back for his second tour of duty as state superintendent. Uh, he was previously the president of the Council of Chief State School Officers. He served as a member of the National Commission on Teaching in America's Future on the National Assessment Governing Board, uh, which oversees the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And he served as a principal, assistant principal, teacher, and curriculum director. So he's been through all of it and uh, has a lot, to, uh, a lot of insight to share. To his left, Dr. Andrew Dare is the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Education Dean, uh, which he has been since uh, 2016, before which he served as University of Houston's College of Education Associate Dean for Research. Uh, he has focused on ensuring that urban serving universities and teacher ed education programs uh, fulfill their responsibility to their surrounding communities, and this residency that they've launched is a good example of that. Brittany Jones is the teacher that uh, we heard about earlier. She is teaching at John Marshall High School in Richmond, Virginia. She's a former resident of VCU's uh, School of Education Teacher Residency Program, uh, before which she received her master's degree in history. And her research focused on how urban districts were effective in avoiding desegregation uh, post the Brown v. Board decisions. So I assume you're teaching history now. Yes, and you have a lot to uh, help your students understand. And then at my far left, uh, that's not a political statement, uh, although it may be, I'll have to check in with Naomi. Uh, <laughs> Naomi Shelton is the Director of K-12 Advocacy at the United Negro College Fund. She focuses there on national education initiatives and community engagement efforts to ensure more African-American students are college and career ready. And prior to joining UNCF, she worked in Washington, D.C.'s Executive Office of the Mayor and in several district agencies leading to efforts to improve access to city services and greater efficiency between departments. And I want to start out with uh, directing this first question to uh, Dr. Payne. Um, Steve, in West Virginia, you are facing teacher shortages. I uh, had some very notable teacher strikes that were all over the television, uh, which have been resolved for the moment. What are you doing in your state to address these shortages? You said the operational word, for the moment. Mm. Uh, and, and all that you shared. First of all, I just need to say thank you to my friend and colleague. It's good to reunite with you. We did some pretty important work the first time around. I failed retirement and came <laughs> back. But, uh, you know, I, I, just a brief comment about the teacher strike in West Virginia, we seem to have uh, started a movement, I guess. And what, what really went on was the devaluation of the teaching profession in my mind. And teachers just became very, very tired of, of, of being devalued as professionals. Uh, there were pieces of legislation that were punitive. Um, salaries were bad. And the real issue that started the whole walkout was the long-term uh, uh, funding of the public employee insurance program. And that's where it all started. And then it, then it mushroomed from there into a teacher pay increase and so forth. So the raise occurred. Uh, I was proud to advocate for that for our teachers uh, with the governor. The governor stepped up about midweek through the strike and he, he, he did the right thing. And now the issue to watch is, will there be a long-term funding solution to the Public Employees Insurance Agency so that employee premiums don't escalate? Uh, last year, for the most part, most of the punitive legislation affecting teachers has gone away. And that's another uh, something to watch. But what Dr. Darlene Hammond described in her research is exactly what's happening in our state. Just a little, just a few numbers for you. 30% of our algebra classrooms are taught by non-certified teachers today. 28% of our geometry classrooms are taught by non-certified teachers. Our flagship university, who I won't name, graduated, has three graduates this year 
who will be math teachers in their senior class. This is a university that has about 25,000 students. So you can see that, that we have some real serious problems. And as, as we, we have all of the same shortages that you described, but we're tackling one area and it's mathematics because we're woefully inadequate in terms of our performance levels. And you know, my feeling is that you have to do one or two things well and then conquer that and then move on to do something else. So, so math is it for us. And um, we've, we've taken a look at, at math very comprehensively, but especially with regard to how we attract our best kids in high school to the profession. And so we are looking at scholarships with our governor and with our legislature, uh, looking for some, some service after that receipt of those scholarships. We're looking at how do we, how do we help those non-certified teachers, 30% of our algebra teachers, how would, you like to f how would you like to be a parent with a student in one of those classrooms? We're looking at some very unique and alternative ways of providing content training to all of those teachers. At the same time, and we'll do this probably through some sort of digital format, we have some great math teachers in our Department of Education, and we have a nice technology system. So there's a way to give those students what they need and yet model outstanding mathematics instruction to those teachers that need that modeling as well. Um, in West Virginia, you're exactly right, we have about a 6% minority population. Our, and, and, and you're exactly right, our teachers of color don't necessarily populate those schools that are the lowest performing that have a higher concentration of minority students. That is a problem for us. The biggest problem for us is poverty. Um, we have the highest percentage of adults without a, a two-year or a four-year degree in the country, 50th out of 50. And the research that I used to know and I think is probably still prevalent is that a mother's educational level closely followed by the father's educational level are probably the strongest determinants of, of student achievement. And uh, so we struggle in that, in, in that area. So we, we have some real equity issues of our own. And, uh, you're, you're just describing our state to a T. We are looking at residency programs. We have started some initial work in that area. I wouldn't say that we're full-fledged, but all of that began with LPI coming to West Virginia and uh, being thought partners and helping us develop some partnerships with four higher education institutions that have a real interest. You know, all the more reason for the Title II funding for the teach funding for the reauthorization of higher education. Those are expensive programs to begin, yet, as Dr. Darlene Hammond indicated, the return on investment for moving in that direction uh, yield, uh, there's a multiplier effect uh, for doing so. So uh, our job is to try to build support politically with legislators that are term limited, that want to see results right away, but to get them to see down the road that this is the right thing to do in the long run for for the profession. So just to sum up, we, we, we have short-term issues that we must address immediately, and then we have some long-term issues that we must address immediately. And all of those require different strategies and different approaches, and, and uh, perhaps there will be a question or two later. Great. Well, we'll just pick up on that thread and uh, go to Dr. Dare, who is um, actually uh, presiding over a residency program. Uh, and I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience and how the residency there is responsive to the needs of the school districts where your teachers are placed, uh, and also how you're thinking about understanding and measuring the success of your program. Thank you. Um, you know, since arriving at VCU in 2016, it was quite evident how strong our Richmond teacher residency program is and a big part of that is obviously the strong partnership that we have with the school division. Uh, we work closely with the HR office in the school division to determine what the recruitment goals are for the residency program. And then the recruitment process is one that is quite rigorous quite intentional about selecting 
residents who are aligned with the school division needs, um, residents who want to be in urban high need schools. Uh, candidates are accepted based on their major, their GPA, and there's a rigorous selection process that includes teaching a mini lesson in front of K-12 students. Um, what's quite interesting is that the students, they actually um, help evaluate or identify through a simple question, do you see this person as your teacher? And when we've looked at the data, the students are actually most accurate in identifying who are going to be successful residents. There's a group discussion and problem solving activity around urban issues to be able to gain what that candidate's thinking is around urban issues. Uh, there's an interview that's conducted both with a school of education staff member and someone and a professional from the school division. And there's also on-demand writing samples and evaluations on their coachability. And so the residents, they're also working in the schools as they're getting trained. There's a fair amount of capacity that's built within the school division for um, enter teacher coaching and online support two to three years um, after that resident completes the program. On the evaluation side, we, you know, we're still a teacher education program, so we still have national, state, um, local, within the school, um, things that we evaluate. But within RTR, our Richmond Teacher Residency Program, we obviously take a very close look at the retention data. Um, we take a close look at the teacher performance data, and we survey principals who hire the teachers who hire our residents. We have a 96% response rate from the principals. And so that high level of a response rate, you know, contributes greatly to us getting good information that we can be responsive in any revisions or tweaks in how folks are being prepared. And we also look at student achievement data, looking at how the graduates of the residency program how student learning outcomes for their students differ from other students. We see gains, for example, in SOL scores in science, edu in a science for example. So it's, um, it's a strong collaboration and it's a responsive collaboration. Um, VCU has quite a large medical system, so one analogy that I use is if instead of being dean of the School of Education, if I was chief of trauma mm -hmm. surgery and the mortality rate was 70% and I had a little program over here where the mortality rate was improved to 85, 90%, would I just continue plugging along knowing I have this great program or would I try to find how I can expand what works in that program in the overall running of the operation. And so that's something that we're looking at is both expanding the residency model. We're now in Chesterfield um, and, uh, and in Petersburg, which are two surrounding school divisions, and are also gonna be moving into Henrico, but also looking at how can we utilize the best practices in the screening, evaluation, selection, and training of the residents, and how can we incorporate that into our traditional programs? Perfect, so I'm gonna ask Brittany to reflect on what has been productive for you about learning to teach in a residency model. Sure, um, you know, teachers often ask me, they say, Ms. Jones, how can you say all that stuff to your kids and they don't have any pushback? And they ask, how do you teach these things and their heads aren't down? To me, it's boring, so I know to the students it must be boring as well. And my first response is, uh, well, because I have it like that. But, um, but honestly, it's the experience. It's the relationships that I've built with my children where I'm able to do those type of things, to say those types of things, to teach these types of things. And learning how to build relationships, it's probably the zenith of the RTR, the residency program. 
Um, being in the classroom, as a resident, you're in the classroom day one, and you're there until the last day of school and every day in between. So understanding the intricacies of what it's like to build a relationship is something that you can't learn in a classroom in teaching school, listening to lectures, it's something that you absolutely have to experience and learn for yourself. And that has been the best way to teach, to create uh, an inclusive learning environment for myself. Um, understanding what the children's triggers are, understanding what their interests are, how they learn. My students come to me with a plethora of traumas that I often haven't experienced myself. So how do we break through those walls? How do we dismantle those to really get to the core of how you can learn um, is what the residency program really taught me. Understanding that we need to care for our children as opposed to just caring about our kids is, was, is what is incredibly imperative, incredibly important. And experience is the best teacher. So the residency program was incredible in helping me with that. I want to ask Naomi, uh, in uh, the United Negro College Fund, the North Star is described as the total annual number of African American college graduates uh, focusing on the activities that ensure more students are college ready and enroll in college and persist to graduation. So what is the role of the teacher and leader preparation in pursuing that North Star? Um, I think UNCF sees that as uh, you can't have a larger pool of students in uh, the profession if you don't have them graduating from uh, from secondary. If they're not if they're not prepared to go into undergraduate and then go on to take the praxis, if they're not prepared with the foundational information. So UNCF uh, in 2012 conducted research that really focused on what are parents' perceptions of K-12 education, what do we think about K-12 um, in, in its totality, and how higher ed can be influential in making sure that where there's a continuum versus these silos of activities that are happening on both sides. And so in the K-12 uh, advocacy and initiatives work that we do at UNCF, um, we're not only amplifying the crises around not not just the academic side, but the need to make sure that there is a, a larger pool of students going to our institutions and uh, PWIs, but making sure that we're helping our institutions think of ways to be innovative around their teacher models. Uh, in, I want to say 2012, Dillard University shut down their teacher preparation program. Um, a lot of our institutions uh, were the, the bedrock of teacher um, teacher production in, um, in previous years. And in the time since they, I'm sorry, Dillard University in uh, New Orleans shut down their program, we know that shortly thereafter, uh, there was a, a surge of white teachers who were not from New Orleans coming into the system and going into this new model of, of uh, teaching with the school system being predominantly charter schools. And so Xavier University, which is uh, known for their science and math, uh, has a very strong teacher program that a lot of people don't know about. And so you have students who have gone to institutions within the region who now have an option to attend a residency model. Uh, so the Norman C. Francis Teacher Residency Program similar to RTR, uh, is a, a homegrown. How are we thinking about producing teachers from a, um, a non-traditional standpoint, but also teachers who are here from this region, from Louisiana, that understand the students here and how they need to be served versus this influx of you know folks who don't really truly understand the students that they're serving. And so what we're doing day in and day out is really trying to connect the dots between higher ed k-12 and thinking about partnerships thinking about how philanthropy can connect dots but also bringing back the idea of how do we value hbcus how do we value uh, minority teachers we can ha have an influx of black teachers but if they go into systems that don't truly value them and see them as disciplinarians versus academics what are we doing by saying we're filling seats versus really valuing the education that they've come from uh, so 
talking about the, um, the economic impact of HBCUs as a totality, thinking about HBCUs, again, as historically the value of what they brought to the teaching profession, how do we bring that all full circle to think about if we have teachers that overwhelmingly come from HBCUs going back into urban districts, they need to be valued as academic leaders and seen as people viable for leadership in schools. So we know that the teacher and leader preparation programs at uh, historically black colleges and minority serving institutions have been underfunded and you mm -hmm. sort of referenced that. Um, what would you like to see in a Higher Education Act uh, with respect to supporting those well, programs? Well, our government affairs official is not here at the moment, and I'm sure that he would be very disappointed in me for not being able to say specifically. But for us to think about what does it mean to, uh, to fund institutions um, disproportionately. So if um, uh, PWI is receiving the same amount of funding that the collective of HBCUs are receiving, then that speaks to a problem, right? Um, if you have um, uh, professional development programs that are being under undervalued, we need to make sure that we're taking, taking funds, thinking about partnerships, and understanding that not only do we need to produce teachers, but we have to support them in their ongoing professional development. Uh, so those aren't specifically to answer your question, but those are the things we should be thinking about in terms of, yes, preparation is important, but also the ongoing support and ongoing thoughts around what is it that teachers need. Once you're in the profession, you still have to continue to, to you know, tune up. Yeah, and, and I'll just uh, take uh, a, a lead from your government affairs person and mention Title III, yes. which can support minority serving institutions in, in this regard in HEA. I want to give you guys a chance to ask questions as well, uh, but before I do that, I want to get back to Brittany with one more because I know that on this college to career pathway, you've been doing some particular work with your students that would be wonderful to hear about. Sure. Uh, so that's, it's tough because when I teach high school, so when my students come to me, oftentimes they've given up on learning and they see education as something that's made for others and not for them. Um, so trying to convince them that college is the next step for them when they've already given up and they're still in high school is incredibly hard. but it's so necessary to uh, push that idea of college on them. So I think as the residency program, they teach you to meet the children where they are while simultaneously having high expectations for them. They, they're not mutually exclusive, both have to exist. Um, and so we have implemented programs for college readiness, uh, SAT tutoring, um, essay writing, things like that to really prepare them for the next level. But in all of that, we've really just tried to instill confidence that they too are a part of education. Yeah. What good teacher preparation will do. Uh, questions and comments, yes. Um, I'm the Director of Teacher Education at Trinity Washington University, and so I've been doing teacher prep for a while, and I agree with all the issues, but one that doesn't come up, which I would hope this bill would address is the, the praxis requirement and how that keeps so many good teachers of color out of the classroom. And I'm not talking about praxis two for your content. I'm talking about praxis one for your college math, reading and writing that students fail repeatedly even though they pass these courses at the college level. I've got students getting an A in statistics but can't pass this test and then they can't become teachers. And I wanna know if there's any way this bill, if your work can address this so that states can allow us to maybe not require it the way it's used or maybe use it as a, you know, okay, you didn't pass praxis, take an extra math class, but right now it's a bar to, to many teachers of color in the district at a lot of the colleges here to get in. And that's a state uh, level requirement, whatever the testing requirements are, and the federal law requires that uh, the results of uh, accountability measures be reported, but it doesn't tell the states what they should be. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of guidance may come out of that. There are about 18 states now that have moved to performance-based assessments for teachers where you actually demonstrate that you can plan a curriculum and teach the curriculum and evaluate student learning. Those assessments tend to have a, uh, less of a disparity 
um, and are more focused on what teachers actually do. And it may be that there can be some encouragements for moving towards what we would see in uh, law as the bar exam or in medicine as the medical licensing exam closely connected to the work uh, that teachers are learning to do. So I might, if I could just follow up. So we're struggling with the exact same thing. So a phrase that says, or other high quality exams might, might be suitable. And, we'll yeah. have that in our state policy coming up. And some states, California uh, has um, uh, a way by which you can demonstrate competency either through a subject matter course of study or through an exam. So there's pathways that go both directions and that's another strategy that some states um, take to um, demonstrate the different features. It, teaching is interesting because most professions you have one test to pass when you finish. In teaching in most states you have three or four tests on the way in and on the way out. And so that's an interesting question to be explored. Uh, this lady over here, and then we'll come back. Later. Hi, uh, Ann Nutter Kaufman. I'm from the National Education Association. I'm also a daughter of West Virginia. I went to West Virginia University, was a West Virginia teacher. My question is really around the urban residency piece. Um, we often call them urban residencies. West Virginia is definitely not urban. As we think about how to do residencies in rural areas, and at the federal level, we often talk about how much we wish that funding between K-12 and higher ed really were latched together a little bit more so that this seamless We're looking to Dr. Darlene Hammond. <laughs> we actually are using her model, and we're taking a pretty hardline stand for our institution of higher education. There's a funding source for them, and they're going to have to meet all the provisions of a high-quality, well-structured teacher residency program for them to receive any money, which means it's not an equitable funding thing from institution to institution anymore. It's performance-based. You have to do the right things, and you're going to, you're going to receive money. Along with that, but my colleague mentioned you're looking at data, and we need to do the same thing about our teacher prep programs. And those that aren't performing, the sta our state board has the ability to step in and say, look, here's our policy. We rarely enforce that, but it's time. And uh, we'll, we're going to take a harder line stand. I don't mean to be uh, you know, that top-down type of leadership, but it's time. There are rural residencies, too, and um, if you are interested in looking at some, I know in California, Kern County has a uh, rural residency with many, many districts around, and so I think those are also evolving for many states. I want to get one person from over here, and then I'm going to go to the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sheila Allen. I am the president of the National Association for Alternative Certification. And I just wanted to correct one thing, because you talked about retention not being good in, alter in alternative certification programs. And I think you have to differentiate among those programs. Um, there are so many different types. And we actually did research with our members and found that retention um, was 70, I think it was 78% over five years for those people who go through good programs. And, and one other thing I just want to say, we're rolling out two things. One is the quality indicators. Our, our organization is putting these out for alternative certification programs to be able to self-assess, go through a review process, and determine if they are good programs and hopefully get reciprocity across states because I think that will help particularly with the veterans and that's one of the reasons this is being pushed out. And the other thing is a course um, for programs to kind of um, to review candidates before they get in. That's an exploring teaching course because a lot of times teach, people go into teaching thinking that they know what it is and then once they're in there find out that they don't. And I think that's one time a reason why that retention is, is low. So we have to make sure they, they know what it is about. I think it's a very good point that there is a range of quality among all kinds of programs, pre-service and alternative programs. Uh, so while you do get differential attrition rates in each sector, you also have some overlap because there are um, poor programs in one sector and good programs in the other that uh, overlap. So I think it's a really good point. In the back there, this young lady uh, uh, with the green sweater, I think. Hi, Barbara Boache from Howard University. How are you guys? <laughs> uh, my question, so as I think about 
you uh, teachers and teacher education and preparing teachers, it starts making me think about school leaders. And so how does this tie in with administrators? Because you can have a great teacher residency program, you can develop the teachers. I myself was a teacher for years, but what happens when they hit or meet um, just you know school administration? That's a really good question, and there are probably several people who'd like I'll to speak to that. <laughs> Dr. Dare? Thanks for that. Um, that, is an, that is a very important issue in terms of leader preparation, and we hear that time and time again that good teachers, and I'll say good and innovative teachers, because it's really the innovative teachers who are moving the needle in our highest need schools but when they leave, oftentimes, they leave because of the leadership. They leave because of the principles. And so, you know, in addition to teacher residency programs, I know that we're looking into and having conversations with two different school divisions on how we can start some type of a leader residency program or a principal residency program. Something else that we're looking at across the board is we, we fundamentally have to prepare our teachers and leaders differently for urban and high need schools. And I struggle with why that is such a hard concept for my colleagues in higher education to understand and appreciate that we have really not succeeded in this area and we have to do something remarkably different. We, we do not talk enough and stress enough about race, culture, poverty, privilege. We don't talk about or help our educators understand about the contextual issues of living in poverty. And I'll agree with my colleague here, which really about poverty. There's a lot of similarities, whether you're talking about urban or rural, and poverty being the largest one. We've got to start talking about trauma-informed care and restorative practices. So we really need to look at some of what I put innovative in quotes because it's really not innovative. Just because you've not looked at it or ignore it doesn't make it innovative, but I'll say innovative and put it in quotes. We need to look at these innovative practices for teachers, but also do the same for leaders so that they understand so that when that uninformed teacher sends a student to the principal office for acting out, not understanding that that child may not have ate that morning, at least that principal will have an understanding. So thank you for that. And just to piggyback off of that, uh, UNCF is being very thoughtful about, again, connecting those dots and thinking through how do we impart uh, strategies from HBCUs to K-12. We'll be releasing a report later this uh, year, early next year, called Imparting Wisdom and thinking about how do you take the strategies that have been helpful in terms of helping students um, at the higher ed level persist through college, how do you apply that to uh, K-12, specifically high school? In addition to that, we're thinking about having leaders leadership um, in all sections of education, education reform, education equity, education uh, across the board. So we have a, um, a K-12 education fellowship where we take rising seniors and place them at organizations, either direct service or uh, support organizations to think through how do you have the right people in the right places to have conversations about all of the things that um, my colleague here has mentioned. But thinking about not only having the leaders and the teachers be thoughtful, but folks who are in the funding space and making sure that you have the right people there, not just all your skin folks, ain't your kin folks, we know that. Right. So making sure that the right people are in the room to make decisions for what we're thinking about when we're thinking, we're creating either models, if we're thinking about how, um, how to amplify a lot of the best practices that are happening. Another report I'll uh, point you to is Building Better Narratives in Black Education, where we have amplified a lot of the black-led efforts that have been successful in outcomes for black students. And so really raising up with the idea, the thought and theory of things that are happening in the education space that are often swept on the rug, not known, not understood, um, but thinking uh, how do we then amplify that work at every level of education, so supports, 
Um, I, Urban League has tons of work across the country that they've uh, done to support education. Uh, some of our charter leaders that are African American but have uh, single site schools that have innovative practices and thinking how do you how do you look at all of those practices and start to apply them across the board in, in systems. And I'm going to take just one more question because we're actually over time. And OK, OK. <laughs> yeah, the one who's saying, pick me, pick me. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm Marty Abbott with the American. <laughs> Marty Abbott with the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. And I just want to suggest that the teacher shortage is probably even more severe than we know. And I'll give you an example from our discipline. We looked at all the state data. And 43 states plus DC said they ha did not have enough world language, foreign language, Chinese, Spanish, bilingual teachers. So we're right up there with, span with yeah. sp special ed and math and science. And I'd like to say that um, often principals will just drop a program mm -hmm. if they can't find a teacher. So in areas like ours, which we know is critical for 21st century skills, knowing other languages, we're just seeing our programs disappear because they can't find the teachers. So I think it's, it's much more severe than we know. And on that uh, happy note, <laughs> I want to just kind of uh, reiterate that all of these issues that we've raised are actually issues that could be addressed in the Higher Education Act. The uh, incentives and supports for people to become prepared to teach, to stay in teaching, the mentoring components, the development of high quality preparation programs, uh, the development of high quality leader preparation programs as well, uh, the development of uh, residency models and school university partnerships under the a teacher Quality Partnerships Grant are all uh, possible places for real, uh, sustained, important improvements in the caliber of our supports for teaching and our capacity to build a teaching profession. So we hope you will all keep that in mind uh, and be ready to work on this important agenda. Uh, again, teaching is the profession on which all other professions depend, so uh, our nation's future depends on that. Thank you.